That video is a great segue to our message for today. That's about Growth Track. And I want to encourage you, if you've not been through Growth Track, you stop out by the Next Steps station and let some folks help you. Growth Track is our meaningful pathway to membership and service. And it's that service part that is the segue to today's message that I want us to spend some time uh, looking at and thinking about uh, how it is that we move from last week's message on the resurrection to what comes next. Uh, our pastor led us in a wonderful time of celebrating over multiple uh, worship gatherings last weekend as we looked at uh, the victorious resurrection of Jesus from the dead and what that means for us. And Jesus said from the cross, it is finished. And from that, he concluded, yes, the work that was necessary for my sin and your sin to be forgiven was absolutely accomplished at his death, burial, and resurrection. But there's still work to be done. And that's what we're going to see today is that there's a continuation of the story. Jesus said to his disciples in preparation for his death, I'm going away, but I'm going to come back. And when I come back, I'll receive you to myself. But there's this in-between time, and that's where we live today. So I want us to take some time to kind of figure out from last week's celebration of the resurrection to today and moving forward, what is it that we give ourselves to? And how is it that we allow God to use us in ways that make a difference? So I want to begin by just asking you if, you if you can think about a time in your life when God brought someone into your life who had the right words at the right time that helped you either come to know Christ or helped you take some significant steps in growing in your faith as a follower of Jesus. Or maybe it was the right words that helped bring some great clarity to you at a moment of confusion and someone God brought to you that they just said the right words at the right time. I'm guessing that you probably have those moments in your life. I know I can think of one specifically in the spring of 1981. I was a freshman at Sanford University in Birmingham, Alabama. I was in the cafeteria early in the morning meeting with a guy by the name of John Ziegler. And he was my discipleship leader that semester. And he asked me in the course of our having breakfast together a question that I've never forgotten. It's more than 40 years later. And I'm thinking that question is so clear to me. He said, Philip, what are you going to do with the rest of the only life that God has given to you? Wow, that's a big question. That's a big picture question. That's a serious question. It's a philosophical question, you know, and I have no idea how I answered that question. I'm sure I bumbled my way through something that tried to make him think I knew what I was talking about, but I didn't. He said to me, uh, can I tell you how I've come to answer that question? I said, yeah, that'd be great. And he said, I've come to the place in my life where I've determined that I really want God to use me to make the greatest possible kingdom impact that I can make for God's glory with my life. And I'm like, wow, that's kind of impressive. I mean, big picture thinking, making decisions based on God, is this going to expand your kingdom? Or are you going to use me to make an even greater impact for the kingdom if I do this versus this? made an impact on my life. It was, it was the right question. It was the right word at the right time for me. And it helped me have some greater clarity. Now, I'm guessing that you, like me, have had similar situations where there have been moments of clarity where someone uh, has brought about um, words that have helped you find a challenge or wisdom that you needed, uh, that it came from a friend or a confidant, or maybe even a stranger that was speaking to you. But it was really a word from God for you, and it was the right word at the right time. I'm amazed at how God uses his word to speak to us and how he uses other people as his instrument to say for us the things that we need to hear. Words of truth, important. We understand that this idea that words are powerful tools, that moment was significant for me in that day. Again, I trust that you've had similar moments that were profound moments that were surrounding words. Words are powerful, and because they're so powerful, we need to make sure that we use great care in the words that we speak. You think about what words can do for people. If you've experienced loss, the right word, the right time, can bring immeasurable comfort to you can warm your heart just because someone speaks the right word to you. But words also can cause injury in, in moments of, of foolishness or carelessness. 
followed sometimes by the letters JK or just kidding. All of us have experienced that moment where we recognize there's a little element of truth embedded in that little jab or in that little funny comment. They can cause injury. Words can be encouraging when they're chosen carefully. They can be painful if they're spoken harshly to us. They can be threatening if they're used viciously. And words also can be harmful to us if they're used maliciously. We get it. We understand that words are powerful. And my guess is that every one of us in the room can think of moments in our lives where we heard someone use words that were hurtful or harsh or unkind uh, or that were bitter or derogatory toward us or about us. And those words are powerful. They stick to us. And maybe that's part of the most challenging part about those kinds of words is that they stick to us. We understand the challenge of the words that run around in our heads sometimes, the words that kind of just won't go away, that, um, that stick with us. When we move from an action or an event to a sp- particular or specific identity, I heard a pastor say recently that he had failed a class in school one time. He said it was a short distance in his mind from I failed a class to identity I am a failure. That's a big difference between those two worlds. And again, maybe you have found that battle in your head of words that won't go away, words like liar or loser or words like damaged or rejected or weak or a burden or complicated or you're high maintenance or you're sloppy or fill in the blank. All of us know those kinds of words that have just stung and that have stayed with us. And I challenge you to be sure that you distinguish in those words the distance between an event and an action and adopting those kinds of words as an identity. I want to encourage you today with a different word for an identity that I believe Jesus would have us use, and I'll get there in just a moment with that word. But it is important, those words that we dwell on, those words that we think about. Words are so powerful that the Bible is actually filled with a lot of words about words. A lot of instruction we find in Scripture that help us understand these powerful tools need to be guided and we need to utilize them carefully. Let me give you just a sampling of some of those. Proverbs ten nineteen is one of my favorites. Uh, Proverbs ten nineteen reminds us that we should let our words be few. It says, in the presence of many words, sin is not lacking. What's the writer of Proverbs telling us? When I go on and on and on, some of you are thinking, maybe I'll make my words few today. I've got a few more words, but when we continue talking, sometimes we venture off into the realm of sin. Recognize that we restrain our words. They are thoughtful, and they're timely, and they're few. But when we fail to restrain our words or we use reckless words, they're thoughtless words. And there are many. The Bible also encourages us not to gossip. It says that gossip is dangerous for us and for others. Proverbs eleven thirteen says a gossip betrays a confidence. And when I begin talking about other people, it only reveals some of my own self-centeredness. The Bible tells us to be careful with our words. The Bible tells us to be honest. Uh, the writer of uh, Exodus tells us in Exodus chapter 20, We're not to bear false witness against our neighbor. We're not to lie. We're to be truthful. Paul writes to the believers in Ephesus that we should let no unwholesome word proceed out of our mouth. But instead, the words that come across our lips should be words that are building and that are encouraging, that are edifying, and they minister grace to those who hear them. Our words really are powerful. That's what Ephesians 4.29 tells us. Jesus says something a little different about our words. He says that our words reveal our heart. In Luke 6.45, Jesus says that it's out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. Hmm. Perhaps not a better barometer or measure for what's in my heart than listening to the very words that come out of my mouth. The words that come out of my mouth say something about what's important in my heart. When I begin exaggerating and puffing about things... I'm just revealing the pride that's in my heart. When I begin teasing, making fun of others, it often reveals jealousy that's in my heart. When I'm complaining, when I'm criticizing, 
It exposes my ingratitude. Our mouth tells something about what's in our heart. Our words are important. Words spoken are also all about timing. That's what the Bible tells us in Proverbs 25, 11. I love this passage of Scripture. It says that a word spoken at the right time is like apples of gold and settings of silver. He's saying it's a thing of beauty. When we have just the right word spoken at just the right time, it is an amazing thing. This is just some of the few texts of Scripture that remind us about our words. Oh, wait, there's one more. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 48 that the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God, it will stand forever. Wow, reminder to us, God certainly has the right words, and we know that we are doing uh, things that are being helpful when we are speaking the word of God. God's words bear repeating. They bear our holding on to. I don't know about you, but for me, the challenge often comes in finding the right word. Just the right word. And that means for me, I need to pause often and think about what it is that I want to say before I speak. I don't know if any of you have that disease where you speak first and then think later. I struggle with that sometimes, and this is a reminder to me. I need to be cautious about my timing, finding the right word. Mark Twain said this about right words. He said, the difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between lightning and a lightning bug. It's a pretty big difference between those two. They are not the same. These two are different, and we should take note of that. So one of the ways that we can know that we have the right words is when we're speaking God's Word. We need to look for ways in our conversation to be able to weave the Word of God into our conversation to encourage those who would hear us. When you think about God's Word, the Bible tells us in uh, John's Gospel that the Word, Jesus, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he had just the right words. Jesus had an amazing economy of words. And the way he used his words powerfully to impact the lives of those uh, that he crossed paths with. Uh, And we're blessed because of the gospel writers, uh, their faithfulness to hear from the Holy Spirit as he brought to mind for them as they're pinning the pages of the gospels. We have an access to be able to see and hear a glimpse of some of those conversations that Jesus had with people. Think about how Jesus' words were brief and they were direct and they were to the point. And they were the right words said to the right audience. Jesus had different words for different audiences. Some of his most harsh words were for religious people. And some of his most gracious words were were for some people who felt very, very, very ostracized and far from God. But just think about some of these quick words that Jesus shared that were packed with meaning. As he was building a team of 12 who would follow him and make a difference in the world, he simply spoke these words, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. They understood their life would be changed if they followed him. To a leper, he said, I'm willing, be healed. To a paralytic, he said, pick up your mat and walk. And he did. To a storm, Jesus said, peace, be still. And the waves were calmed. To a blind man, Jesus said, this has not happened to him because of his sin, nor his parents' sin, but so that the glory of God might be displayed in his life. Go now, wash in the pool of Siloam. And that man received his sight. To Lazarus, he said, Lazarus, come forth, and brought a dead man back from the grave to life. To a confused group of men who were following him about where he was going as Jesus was preparing them for his death, He said to them, I am the way, I am the truth, I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. To a dying thief on the cross who simply wanted to be remembered, Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. To the Father, he said of those that were torturing him, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. And to a broken disciple who had denied Jesus, who had returned back to his craft of fishing, as he makes his way back toward the shore, he sees a figure standing there. It's Jesus. Jesus has prepared breakfast for the disciples. And there on the shore as they approach the disciples, Jesus says to him, Peter, why did you deny me? No, that's not, I'm sorry. That's not what he said. That's not what he said. He said, Peter, why weren't you there when I needed you most? No, that's, that's not what he said either. 
No, no. He said, Simon Peter, do you love me? Peter said, Lord, you know I love you. And he said, then feed my sheep. What a great relational question that Jesus posed to Peter in this moment. Helping him to understand that he wasn't bearing a grudge against him. He was restoring him and telling him, you're going to be used in my kingdom in the days ahead. Great words, powerful words. The gospel writer Matthew ends his story of the words of Jesus with these words, final words, these, some of his last words to his disciples. And Jesus said to them, look, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go into all the world, make disciples out of all the nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe everything that I've commanded you, and lo, I will be with you always, even to the very end of the age. Jesus had just the right words that he spoke to them in this final moment after his resurrection, before he ascended to be with the Father. Words that would be remembered, words that would be repeated, and words that would be reproduced in the lives of the disciples and in our lives as well. So what are these disciples' words? What are the words that Jesus gave to these men? What was he telling them to do? He was telling them that they needed to go and do for others exactly what he had done for them. He had called them to follow after, after him. He had spent time with them. He had taught them. He had invested his life in them. He had shown them how God desired for them to live. He had taught them how to love others. He had given them a picture of love. He had sent them out on assignment. Times when they failed, he helped them debrief and understand what went wrong. He taught them how to pray. Jesus had invested these three years of his life in them. And now he's telling them, you need to go do the very same thing for other people that I've done with you. Wow. Pretty big assignment. There was a message that they had of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus that they were now responsible for getting out to the rest of the world. And now it was up to them to decide what were they going to do with what had been given to them. I said last Sunday we celebrated the resurrection, but there was still work to be done. And Jesus is telling them, here's the work that needs to be done. We've got to get this message out to the whole world. They had to decide what would happen. Would this message that was entrusted to them die with their generation or not? We know the answer to that. The good news for us is that it didn't die with their generation. This idea of words being powerful and choosing our words careful is something our pastor does incredibly well. I, I love it. He's very specific. If you'll listen to his language, he, he thinks through the words that he's going to say, and he's very clear. I'm grateful for that. Last week, he chose two words to focus on. He said, because Jesus not only died for us, but rose again, we can have victory. He said that victory was possible in uh, victory over our sin, victory over death, and victory in this very life that we live every day. But then he made a distinction. He used one other word, and he said, but that's not for everybody. Who's it for? It's for those who would believe. For those who would believe the message. Why would he use the word believe? Because it's the word that the Bible uses. It's the word of God. He made uh, great efforts to help us understand that it was not just giving intellectual assent. Oh yeah, there was a man named Jesus, a good teacher 2,000 years ago. No. He said this idea of believing has everything to do with trusting. The one who would entrust their life to Jesus. Who would count on what he had done for them to provide the forgiveness of sin. Not their own self-efforts. Words mean things. Words are powerful. They communicate specific messages. And he was intentional in helping us with understanding that. So if we're going to understand this idea about Jesus saying, go and make disciples now, there's still more work to be done. We have to learn. We have to understand these words correctly. We need to learn what they mean. Well, the good news is that word disciple means to learn. And we got to learn about that. We need to learn what it means. Well, we need to be a disciple. But keep in mind that a disciple by definition, is a disciple maker. So what Chris Adsit writes in his book on personal disciple making is that a disciple, by definition, is a disciple maker. Why? Because Jesus said, I've spent this time with you. I need you to go repeat the process. He said, the real test of whether you've learned is whether you've put it into action. 
And so now Jesus is calling them to follow, to obey his command, his instruction, to go everywhere and take this message to a watching world. Well, these men took that message seriously. So when we think about this idea of a disciple being a disciple maker, uh, the disciple is actually involved in, yes, making disciples, but put more specifically in making disciple makers because this continues on and on. It's 2,000 years later, and we are gathered here together today because of faithful men who entrusted a message to faithful men. So how do we go about doing this? Well, the good news for us is that the Bible answers that question. Uh, It tells us what they did. It tells us what happened uh, after Jesus gave them this instruction and sent them out. He ascended to be with the Father. The book of Acts tells us the Holy Spirit came. Peter, the one he just restored in John chapter 20, now preaches, proclaims the gospel, tells all of these that are gathered in Jerusalem about a God who sent his son to pay a price for their sin. If they would but believe, they could too experience this new life. The Bible tells us there in Acts that 3,000 were saved that day, exponential growth. And now all of a sudden, these people are needing to come to understand more about what it means to be followers of Jesus. And they are growing and they are multiplying and they are telling other people. Acts 9 tells us about a man by the name of Saul, a Jewish religious leader. He is intrigued by this message. He's confronted by Jesus personally, and we read that in Acts 9, but he comes to believe on Jesus, and his life has changed from the inside out. Guess what he starts doing? He begins making disciples. He starts going from city to city, making disciples and gathering these believers together and helping to plant churches. Acts 16, he meets a young man named Timothy. As Timothy comes to faith in Christ, he too wants to follow with Paul and go with him, so now Paul is helping to train Timothy and disciple him, and he's traveling with him from city to city until he gets to Ephesus. And then the Apostle Paul says, okay, you've learned enough right now, enough to get started at least. You stay here, I'm going on. And so he leaves Paul behind in Ephesus, or leaves Timothy behind in Ephesus to begin or continue the journey of making disciples in that city and through that church. The Apostle Paul would continue to have impact on his life because he will continue to write to Paul or to Timothy and to be in touch with him. Well, the Word of God helps us understand what he said to him because we have two letters uh, in our New Testament, 1st and 2nd Timothy, are letters that the Apostle Paul wrote to him. And we have the book of Ephesians that the Apostle Paul would have written to the believers in the church at Ephesus. So we have some idea of what the things are that Paul said to him. So I want us to look at just two verses of Scripture today from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 to see if we can gain some clarity on what is that work that's left to be done and what's what's my part in that? What do I need to be doing in that journey? Paul writes to Timothy in verse 1, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is found in Christ Jesus. Verse 2, he says, In the things that you have heard from me in the presence or among many witnesses, Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. There's so much packed in that passage of Scripture, and there's such a wonderful picture of a reproducible process that God gives us for taking the message of the gospel to the ends of the earth. The first verse, he says, be strong in grace. Let me just say it this way, that what Paul did not say to Timothy was be strong in the law. Be strong in the rules. Be strong in justice. Be firm. Be tough. No. He said, be strong in growing in the grace that is found in Christ Jesus. As a follower of Jesus, what we discover in our lives is that the longer we follow after Jesus, the more gracious we should become. Not bitter, mean, and cantankerous. No. As we grow older, we should grow in grace. And Paul was saying to Timothy that the grace of God is sufficient for you. It will carry you through this ministry of making disciples. Grow strong in that. Be strong, not on your own, not in your own strength. It reminds me of John 15. Jesus said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We must abide in Christ. He's helping Timothy know, you stay close to Jesus. You grow in the strength of the grace that is provided to you in Christ, and you will be effective in this ministry. So verse 2 reveals what I think are the three R's of discipleship. I know we have three R's of education, reading, writing, and 
arithmetic. I know it doesn't start with an R, but reading, writing, arithmetic, okay? So for discipleship, I think that there are three R's that we find here in this text that help us to know what is our job? How can we help accomplish the task ahead of us? He begins by saying um, that a disciple remembers. Paul says to Timothy, and the things that you heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. It's like you need to remember, you need to reflect on the things that you've already learned. Timothy, you have something to give. There is a well out of which you can give to others because it's been entrusted to you. A message has been passed on to you. Now you need to remember that message so that you can do something with it. What is it that he's learned? Well, certainly we know just from First and Second Timothy and from Ephesians alone. We know that Paul would have helped him understand that we need to remember that we were dead in the trespasses of our sin. But God, because he is rich in mercy, sent Christ to us. We know that he would have been encouraged and reminded to hear these words that it's by grace that you are saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's not of works. Otherwise, you'd be bragging about it. It's the grace of God extended to you. He would have learned about living a thankful life. He would have learned how to pray. He would have learned about uh, caring for and ministering to others around him. He would have learned the importance of Scripture and understood that all Scripture is God-breathed, that it's useful, it's profitable uh, for um, reproof, for teaching, for instructing and training in righteousness. He would have understood that he needed to study to show himself as an approved worker of God. These books tell us what Paul would have been telling him. But the primary message that he would have heard, remember the things that you heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, are the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. It is the gospel, according to 1 Corinthians 15. So he said, you need to remember those things, but you don't need to just remember them for the sake of pondering. They need to remember them so that you can do what a disciple does, and that's a disciple repeats. He says that you need to entrust these things what you've been taught, entrust them to faithful men. Other people around you who will be faithful to do something with what is given to them. Those who will be faithful to repeat these words all over again. Let me remind you that when it comes to the gospel, we don't have to be real creative. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Pastor Eric and I were talking last week about the, um, the challenge with Easter. People ask you, what are you preaching on this Easter? The same thing I preached on every other Easter. The resurrection of Jesus. That's what we tell. That's the story of Easter. I will find a way to do it maybe a little differently, but it's the same story because it's the most important story. The Bible says that the gospel is the power of God into salvation for those who believe. And so that's the same story that we're telling. We don't have to be real clever, real creative. But he says that you need to entrust this to certain people. Faithful people. Through my years here working with student ministry or working with adults in, uh, in our groups and our discipleship ministry, I've often used the acrostic FAT to say, I'm looking for fat people. Now, I'm not saying anything about weight. I could shed a pound or two myself. But the acrostic that says faithful, available, and teachable, those are the kinds of people that you're looking for to lead. Well, I found a better acrostic a few weeks ago that I like a lot better. It was faith. So faithful people, available people, intentional people, teachable people, and humble people. What great characteristics. Wouldn't you want those characteristics to be said of your life? That your life is marked by faith. Uh, and that, those are, that you're trustworthy for someone to entrust the story of the gospel to. He goes on in this passage of Scripture to tell him that there are going to be difficult days ahead. This is not going to be easy. And he gives him examples of the kinds of people that have great dedication and discipline. And he identifies for him this picture of the soldier, the athlete, and the farmer. And it's like these people all represent certain characteristics of dedication and determination and discipline. Those are pictures of faithful people. The gospel hinges on our telling this story from one generation to the next. But the third R is that a disciple reproduces. Did you see the very end of that verse? He said that you're going to entrust this message to faithful men who will in turn be able to teach others. It's kind of wash, rinse, repeat, wash, rinse, repeat, wash, rinse, repeat. It is the same thing 
over and over. And the story continues. Entrust this to faithful men who will teach others by using their right words, God's word, at the right time. Did you get that? We remember what we've learned, what we've been taught, the word of God. We repeat those words. We repeat that message to those who are faithful. And then we reproduce by those faithful individuals telling others, repeating what they have been taught. Think about it like branches on a family tree. You have a spiritual heritage. You have a spiritual lineage. Someone, somewhere, spoke the right words to you to help you understand the gospel. I don't know who that was. Somebody carried the message to you. Who was that? Someone or some ones helped you begin to grow and understand the things that you needed to know and understand to be a fruitful and effective follower of Jesus. And then the tables turn a little bit. So who is it that God has given you that you could share the right words of the gospel story with? Who is it that God has given you that you can invest in them and helping them know what it means to be a follower of Jesus and how they can grow up? Who has God given you that is that faithful person that will also take that message on to the next person, the next generation? And who is it that they're passing that message along to and helping them to continue that process? I said a moment ago, Paul reminded Timothy, is this going to be easy? No, no, it's going to be hard. He tells them that he needs to endure hardships. He needs to endure sufferings in the midst of this. There is still much work to be done, but it's indeed worth it if we live in obedience to the command of Jesus that we go into the world and make disciples. At our house, we say it this way sometimes. This is me to Jan and Jan to me. Um, In difficult moments, did you expect an easy life? Um, And it's it's our joking way of saying, you know, did you expect life to be easy? Did you think there were going to be no hurdles? There were going to be no hardships? We know better than that. And it's a way for us to reframe and to remember, look, we have to endure hardships. And Jesus said that there would be suffering in following him. We've chosen. We've chosen the wrong Savior to follow if we thought it was going to be an easy life. Jesus told us, as we follow him, if the world hated me, it will also hate you. Part of Paul's words to Timothy really were to call out for him the hard task in life. There are going to be some tough things to do. I see this quote from time to time on Facebook or social media uh, platforms of uh, different kinds, and it's often attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, It's questioned greatly by theologians as to whether he ever said this or not, but he gets the attribution of it frequently. And maybe you've heard it as well, and um, you can tell me whether you've heard it or not, and we'll see. It says, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use... Hey, you have heard it. Okay, good. If necessary, use words. Can I help you with that for a moment? Words are necessary. Words are essential if we're going to proclaim the gospel. I know it's easy for us to fall into this temptation of thinking, my neighbors will see me leave on Sunday morning early and they'll know I'm going to church and they'll figure something out about me probably. They'll see me come home at 1230 or 1 o'clock after lunch. And they'll, they'll figure out something, I'm sure. That's not how the gospel is communicated. The gospel is not communicated just by seeing things around us. The gospel is a message. It is written and it is spoken. And these first century disciples were told to go and tell this story over and over and over. See, Romans chapter 1 tells us that what can be known of God Uh, in a general revelation sense, is plain to all. I started reading this morning, the heavens declare the glory of God from Psalm 19.1. That's true. But here's what's not ever going to happen. No one's ever going to the beach and watching waves crash on the shore or going to the mountains and watching the leaves fall uh, in, in, in the fall of the year change colors or watch an amazing sunset and figure out from watching those natural occurrences There is a God, and He is holy, and I have sinned, and my sin has separated me from that holy God, and I am destined for an eternity separated from Him. 
But because of that, God loved me and he sent his only son, Jesus, to do for me what I couldn't do for myself. That was to live a sinless, perfect life. And then to sacrifice his life because the wages of sin is death. And the payment that I owed was sin. And Jesus died a substitutionary death on my behalf. He rose from the grave so that I could live again. That if I would turn from my sin and place my faith and trust in him, I could have new life from the inside out. And I could stop trying to work hard to be better and think maybe God would love me if I could just be good enough. Wow. Can I just tell you? Nobody's watching a sunset and getting that message. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen from watching the leaves turn. It's not going to happen by watching the waves come on the ocean. It is the gospel message, and it is to be delivered. It has been delivered to us once and, all for, once, um, and for all for the saints, and we are to deliver that message to others. They won't get it by just watching us and just kind of figuring it out somehow. It doesn't happen that way. We are called to take this message of the gospel to the rest of the world. So how will you be a part of this process? How will you be a part of the reproducing process of disciple making in the life of our church as a follower of Christ? Well, first, let me ask you just to clarify this question in your own mind. Who are you following You see, if you're following after Jesus, he said, if you follow me, I'm going to do something. I'm going to change you. I'm going to make you fishers of men. We've got to be following Jesus. And as we follow him, we recognize we're going to be on mission with him together, pointing others to Jesus and helping them grow up to be just like him. If you're following Jesus, then I'll ask you another question. Who's following you? Look behind you. Who is coming along behind you? Who's hearing your words? Who's hearing the right words from you? Who's watching you as you lead by example what it means to be a follower of Jesus? How are you teaching them and challenging them to become a teacher to another or a leader to another? This leads me to be reminded that I'm thankful for every life group leader in this church. From those who lead the youngest to the senior, most senior adults in our church. I'm thankful. Looking out here, I see a kids ministry leader, student ministry leader, adult leaders here in the life of our church, and there are preschool leaders. Yes, I see preschool leaders in here as well. And I'm grateful for every one of you because you get this. You've given your life to figuring out what's my part in helping fulfill the Great Commission, in making disciples in the lives of of others around us. Our leaders in our church understand that we are responsible for making disciples, for making disciple makers. I'm thankful for people in this church looking around the room in here that get this idea that I am to give myself away in this task of making disciples until Jesus comes. Some of you have opened your homes and you're doing groups in your homes throughout the week. I'm grateful for your commitment to allow God to use you in that way. Others of you looking around the room, I'm seeing young life leaders in the room here, people that are giving hours of their life to investing in students on high school campuses, on middle school campuses, and in their homes, making disciples, making disciple makers. In the room, I recognize that there are parents And there's so many parents in the room that get it. When I look over my shoulder, who's following me? I got kids following me. Started this worship hour with my grandson. Another generation that needs to hear the story of Jesus. Parents who get it, that they realize that who they are influencing most for the sake of the kingdom are children that are behind them looking to see what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus. I'm grateful for individuals in our church that are engaged in writing and using their words in writing, the right words to help other people be challenged, to be encouraged. We've got folks in our church who write uh, some of our life group materials and resources for our leaders to use. Uh, Individuals here who are involved in translation of the Bible into other languages so that other people can have the right words of the gospel to have their lives changed. I'm grateful for men and women that are serving on bases that Uh, Naval Station Norfolk and Little Creek that are leading groups in becoming disciples and disciple makers. 
folks that are at Old Dominion University and Regent University that are engaged in giving themselves to making disciples on those campuses. Do you hear that? God's using this church in some amazing ways, and people who get this, I need to be a part of making disciples with others. There are many others. I can't mention them all. I didn't mean to ignore you if I didn't say your group or your circumstance, but I'm excited that God uses us in this way. But if if you're sitting here today and listening to the words that I'm sharing with you, my challenge is, what is it that God's saying to you today? What, what is the word that he has for you today? If you're following Jesus, you're making disciples, my encouragement is to press on, keep on doing it, work hard, do the work of an evangelist, endure hardships, continue the work that God has given you to do. Repeating what you're remembering so that we'll see that reproduced in the lives of others. But if you're not currently engaged in some way where you're giving yourself to investing in the next generation, I want to share with you at least three opportunities, three ways that I think you could do that, uh, be a part of that. First one of those is next Sunday afternoon on the 14th of April. We'll be having our next round of foundations and discipleship. It's an afternoon of training for individuals in the life of our church that want to understand what is this reproducible process that we offer, uh, that the Bible says, not that we offer. Um, How is it that I do the very things we're talking about today? We'll give you a tool and a resource and a way to do that. I want to encourage you to sign up for that training today. You can grab a blue card, fill out your name on that card, just write foundations on the back of it. We'll take you through that training next week and help you Walk away with some tools that you could use, some practical tools that would be helpful. You know what excites me most about next week? I have to fly out of town next Sunday afternoon. I won't even get to lead this training. I'll be a part of the training at the very beginning. I'll say hello to some of you that are going through that, but there are other people that have been trained, and the joy is getting to be able to go and saying, you're in great hands. These people are going to do a great job because they know what to do. They are repeating a process of helping us on this journey of making disciples. So that's one way you could do that. I'm not engaged somewhere. I just want to know more about how I could be a part of making disciples. Please fill out that card, write foundations on it, or go to the Next Step Center. Someone will help you with that. Second way, June 24th through 28th, Vacation Bible School. Oh, my goodness. Where are you, Vacation Bible School folks? All right, see. We already had a boatload of people signed up for Bible school before Easter. I'm excited about what God's doing with this. But perhaps not a greater single opportunity that we have summer after summer to have 15 concentrated hours with children. It's an amazing moment. I want to encourage you to raise your hand, not literally in here, but by grabbing this blue card. You can use that QR code that's up there. You can go register at the registration station. Just go by next steps. Find a way. Fill out this card and write VBS on the back of it. Julie Hunt or Jan Frost, one will get in touch with you. Why? Because it's a place where you could use your words and the gifts that God has given you to invest in this process of making disciples. We realize that we are sowing seed in the lives of young individuals that will bear much fruit in the days and months and years to come. What a great opportunity to do that. That's two. Foundations, Vacation Bible School. Here's the third one. Pastor challenges us week after week in here to participate as a church in one, one, one. He says, we pray for one minute at 1 p.m. for one thing every week, every day. And so this, this uh, day, I'm going to challenge you to all join me in praying this prayer. Lord, give me the right words today at the right time said in the right way to the right person. Why? That prayer can help you focus and be on mission. It's kind of a restatement of Psalm 1914. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. The words of my mouth. God, would you put a guard over my mouth? God, would you fill my mouth with the right words so that I might be on mission today? And I might speak a word of encouragement or I might speak a bold word of the gospel or I might speak a word of hope to someone around me 
who is in desperate need of help and hope and encouragement. The gospel is encouraging. The gospel reminds us that there is hope. That prayer gives us a way to say, God, I'm, I'm on mission for you today. My mouth is yours. So God, fill it with the right words spoken at the right time, in the right way, to the right person. And then it's a part of the combination of Proverbs 25, 11. At that word, spoken at just the right time, it's like apples of gold in settings of silver. Every one of us can participate in that and can be a part of praying daily for God to use us in finishing the work that God has given us to do, going into the world and making disciples. Now, lest what I've said sound like only if you're teaching a group in this church are you making disciples, that's not what I've said. I promise you that God will bring the right people in your life around you. If you're available to them and ready to be used by God, he will allow you to intersect with them. That's what that training next week is about, helping you be equipped to say, God, who are the people? Maybe it's two or three people that God has put in your life that you are supposed to be investing in them helping them, making a difference in their life. I'm sitting here looking at you because you've got a group you started in your house just a few weeks ago with a handful of young girls. I'm just grateful that God calls us to partner with him and he'll allow us to use our words to make tremendous kingdom impact. Last thought and we're gone. That is... If you don't know Jesus, if you've not done what the pastor challenged us to do last week, if you've not believed on Jesus yet, all of this is worthless. Okay? You're, not, you're not making an impact on the lives of other people. You're not helping them grow to be like Christ. You're not doing any of that. That's okay. Your first step is you need to turn from your sin and you need to call on Jesus and you need to say to him, Lord, I need you to step out of heaven and step into my heart. Take over my life. Make me new from the inside out. God, I'm trusting in you to make me who you want me to be. He will begin that work in you. So my challenge to you is call on him. You need help in making that response? Stop by next steps. There'll be some folks that would love to talk with you about how you can take that step of faith. But today, I know that our focus has been on this task of saying, what's the task that remains until Jesus comes? And it is making disciples who are making disciples, who make disciples. You are somewhere on that chain, and I'm praying for you that God would allow you to have a number of connections that follow after you in this lineage and heritage of faith. That God would allow you have the greatest kingdom impact that you can have with the rest of the only life that God has given you. Let's pray.